So, hi, uh, my name is Jan Schultz. I'm a postdoc at Cambridge um, at the Kavli uh, Institute. Um, I'm really sorry for the long title. I think we can just uh, sort of shorten it to the detection of massive molecular gas and dust hills around uh, Redshift 2 or cosmic known ERQs. So, first of all, um, why should we care? Sorry. Um, so, Circum galactic medium is this sort of uh, interchange between what's happening in the galaxy and what's happening in the universe on a larger scale, right? So this is the famous, uh, for any CGM person, this is the famous uh, image from Thomas in 2017. And you see is that you have a galaxy in the middle and um, you have pristine gas accreting from the IGM onto the um, onto the galaxy. By pristine gas, I mean extremely low metallicity, uh, sort of mostly helium and uh, hydrogen. But you also have outflows that are actually pushing from the galaxy um, with all the material that's metal and rich from all the star formation. You know, sometimes it leaves the dark matter halo, sometimes it doesn't. Uh, when it doesn't, it actually sort of goes into the CGM, it loses velocity, and then sort of rains back, uh, recycles back on the galaxy. And this is a quite a vital and important part of the of the way we can measure uh, feedback, both star formation and AGN feedback. And there have been a number of previous detections of cold gas halos. This isn't at high redshift. This is not. Usually people use uh, C2 uh, emission line. The reason is that is that C2 at 158 microns is the primary emission line at far infrared to cool the ISM or gas in general. So it's incredibly bright. Fortunately, it also, it, because of that, it traces both atomic, partially molecular, and ionized gas. So it's not very good at figuring out exactly what sort of phase of gas it traces. But you can see on these plots, which are basically the radial profiles, is that the C2 tends to be more resolved than the stars, for example, from HST or the warm dust by the um, from the continuum in far infrared. Um, it's Fujimoto uh, Teiji's work on the top left were from the Alpine. And on the right, you actually see these uh, sort of galaxy mergers a little bit uh, in CO43, which would trade your excited but cold gas. The thing is that all of these are star forming galaxies. Uh, they're quite star forming. Um, however, the question is, should we see them around AGNs and quasars, right? Quasars have way more powerful outflows. Some of these can go, you know, two or 3,000 kilometers per second, both ionized and molecular uh, gas outflows, which means that uh, they should have quite a lot of this sort of um, uh, gas, cold gas on a large scale. Um, but nobody has really looked at it that much. So this is what we are trying to answer right now. Hmm. So we look into the extremely red quasars. Uh, for those who don't really do quasars and are already kind of like, why do we have so many categories of quasars? Um, I have been dealing with quasars for quite a few years and I have exactly the same question. I think it's just astronomers like to over categorize things. But in this case, the extremely red quasars were selected as something that is not just red, but extremely red, to the point where they are almost not visible in <clears throat> I band anymore. And you can only actually see them in Y's W3, which means around 60 micron rest frame. Um, they have very powerful outflows, ionized outflows of roughly up to 5,000 kilometers per second. You see the um, um, you see the O3 profiles on the right, and you can actually see that the O3 doublet is almost completely merged together. It's just blended. There are supposed to be several distinctive peaks, but it's not. It's just one. It looks like a complicated emission lines, but actually two uh, plus H beats or somewhere. And they are luminous. The volumetric luminosity is around 10 to 47 to 10 to 48 ergs per second. For those who rather prefer uh, solar luminosities, we are talking 10 to 13. 0.2, you know, uh, solar luminosities and higher. Some people say that the reason why they have such a powerful outflow is not because they are special, it's because they are so luminous and there is a correlation between the outflow luminosity and the luminosity of the quasar. So uh, maybe they are just not actually special and dusty. They are just very luminous the way we selected them from all sky surveys. So, you know. 
And we used a, fifth, a sample of 15 ERQs selected at a rate of 2.1 to 2.5 in band six. It was ALMA observations. The reason we decided to look at these 15 is we realized that they were public in the archive for four years and nobody write a paper on them. And we realized that actually the sensitivity and um, sensitivity and the resolution is actually matches our requirements. So we went for it. But there, there seems to be very sort of a uniform selection of extremely red quasars. Fred Hammond, who is the PI of this program, has an extremely good job in selecting the, these quasars for the work. And these are just examples of somebody with an IFU who actually were able to look at the outflows in more detail. Um, we the, the band six at stretch of 2.1 to 2.5 will cover the following emission lines. It's C1221, which is tracing your cold gas at around 40 Kelvin. CO7 to 6, which is tracing your temperature uh, of around 150 Kelvin cold gas. Uh, so from my perspective, as an IFU of optical IFU person, these are ex still extremely cold. Uh, then you have your water transition, which is tracing roughly 200 Kelvin gas, but extremely dense. You actually need a very high density in order to have uh, water emission. Um, which I would say, if you want to know um, water emission in quasars, look at Flora Stanley's work. Um, uh, she has done uh, quite a lot of work on these. And then, of course, there is a dust continuum that you get. This is restrained 370 micron. Uh, for people who don't really do galax galaxy SEDs or extragalactic SEDs, they usually they peak around 150. So you are tracing the Rayleigh genes tail of the cold gas, a uh, cold dust of around 30 Kelvin at this point. So the ALMA observations were 0.7 to 0.9 arc second in full with half maximum when we imaged them with natural weighting. The largest recoverable scales were sort of in the more than two arc second, which is ideal for our work. And they have quite large full width, because they are powerful quasars, they have a turbulent ISM and they have full with half maximum as in the line width of around 900 kilometers per second. Um, you know, some of them are maybe only 400, but most of them are quite big. It's probably, it's not necessarily that they, you would see, uh, it's probably just very turbulent. Uh, they are massive, but not that massive compared to 900 kilometers per second. And I think it's just mostly uh, the quasar and all the outflows are mixing the ice and causing the line widths, even when there are no obvious outflows as in some sort of a wings or anything like that. It's all just a, a big mess in these quasars. As you can see, we have amazing detections um, for the actual host. However, the problem is that we are looking at the halo emission. The halo emission is on much larger scales, and it's actually also uh, it's going to be much fainter than the quasar, it's a quasar host galaxy itself. So we need to do stacking, and we need to do stacking in both image plane and in both UV plane. In um, I'm going to skip a little bit of the of, of the stacking in the image plane. I think lots of people have done it. There are lots of codes out there. Uh, but more important is how we modeled the stack. So we have a stack cube. Um, you have a galaxy in it. And what you want to do is that you are going to collapse the cube along the frequency channel uh, or along the velocity axis in order to create a moment map. And then what you are going, you're going to have a ring aperture and you are going to slowly extract, uh, you're going to extract the medium brightness uh, inside a ring aperture. And you do the same thing for beam, which is your blue. And then you have the data points, which is the red. And you can see this like, oh, our quasar is actually resolved uh, or the emission is actually resolved. It's larger than beam, but we are interested in the things on the large scale. But the thing is that you can have beam smearing. Uh, you can't just say it's like, oh, things are larger than beam. Therefore, it, you have a, you know, uh, it's therefore the emission is on this type of scale. So this is how it looks when you do all of the different uh, stacking uh, weightings. Because when you stack, you can choose what weighting. So you have either no stack, uh, no weighting. You have the inverse RMS where you penalize objects with large uh, or observations with uh, large noise. Since they are all from the same program, they all had very 
a very much unified RMS, then based on the peak of the emission in the norm, uh, and then the combination of the different previous different schemes. We are going to sort of look at the inverse RMS uh, stack um, weighting here because that's the probably the cl cleanest one. And you have to now model the radial brightness profiles. Um, usually, you do it is that you take some sort of an intrinsic model, which is at in our case a two D Gaussian. Uh, with known widths, we convolve it with the PSF. We know very well how what's the PSF, what's the beam of the uh, of the object. Then we calculate the we have a, some sort of a convolved model. We calculate the radial uh, radial profile for this model. We then compare it to the data using MCMC algorithm, and that way we can actually find um, can actually find the best fit of the intrinsic size of your object. And then you can do more complex models. So for example, you do two different Gaussians with uh, some sort of a, one has one size, the other one has a different size, and then there's some sort of a ratio between them. Uh, okay, so it turns out we, we need actually a secondary source. So this is your C1 uh, stacking. Um, these are the extracted radial brightness profiles, and this is uh, the orange is a single model. Uh, it's a convolved model, but it's a single Gaussian uh, Gaussian component. And the green bits on it are the real residuals. And you can see that in large scales of something above 1.2 arc second, uh, there are quite a strong residuals um, that you see. And therefore, you would say that there is some sort of emission on large scale. And when you fit two different uh, Gaussian profiles, one sort of corresponding to the quasar host galaxy and another one to the, let's call it halo for now, uh, then you get uh, uh, then you get much better residuals. The same thing is for CO7 to 6. Uh, you can actually see that it's quite strong um, in there. And this, what's interesting is the same thing is for the dust. I need to speed up. Um, and we inferred the mass of the molecular gas in the halo around 10 to the 10. So 20% of the gas and the gas supply are actually in the, uh, in the halo. We can also subtract the quasar host, host galaxy, and you can actually see that there is a very much an emission on scales of larger than so three arc seconds uh, in, uh, right, uh, in diameter. We also did the same thing in the uh, UV plane, asking more. We used the later, we used the UV, uh, UV stacker from the Nordic Arc node. And you can always see that there's a sort of a uh, blip in the UV uh, in the on the UV plot on very short scales, which corresponds to the light scale in the sky. Uh, sort of you can very clearly see it in the bottom right in the dust stacking, confirming that actually in the image plane, it's not just some sort of uh, beam residuals that we are stacking, it's actually the data. So there are uh, 14 kiloparsec large halos, which means that for a galaxies at Redshift 2 that are roughly the size of eight kiloparsec from HST, uh, from Foster Schreiber, for example, this is sort of twice as big as the galaxy. We also see this around AGNs. So this is Gareth Jones' work. Uh, and you can see that he actually sees around normal AGNs uh, in Redshift 2, uh, the CO, um, uh, CO uh, halos on roughly 25 kiloparsec scales, 15 to 25 kiloparsec. I'm going to skip this bit. Okay, so chicken or egg, what was there first? Was there first a quasar or the, halo, the cold gas halo? And the reason is that we show that there is C1, there is CO, and that there is dust, which means that there is a significant metal enrichment of the CGM in these uh, large-scale gas reservoirs. But was it the quasar that pushed it to 15, kilo, 15 kiloparsec? Well, assuming sort of typical molecular gas outflows, uh, that would be of 900 kilometers per second, what we see in some quasars, it would take 15 to 35 million years to get to 15 kiloparsec. That's way more than quasar episodes. Quasar episodes or aging episodes last around one to five million years. If you would say, yeah, but you need you have the ionized gas outflows, so you can get there with a speed up to 5,000 kilometers per second, what we saw at the beginning in the introduction, that would take around five to 10 million years. It would need to cool down from roughly 10,000 Kelvin to 150 Kelvin. But we know that uh, 
you know, gas can cool very quickly. Um, so that is doable, but just on the edge. So rather than quasars actually potentially creating these halos, it's kind of an untied schedule. Maybe it's a mixture of a past Aegean and star formation activity. And now maybe all of this cold gas is accreting back on the galaxy. And that's what's actually triggering this massive obscured quasar episode in the first place. So the quasar can create it with this halo, but also it can just uh, clearly be that it can be there because of the halo in the first place. We cannot distinguish between these two scenarios. So here are my conclusions. We look at some very cool ALMA data at uh, redshift uh, two and a half ish. Um, we What's very, very important is that this experiment was, we were able to do this experiment because it's actually poor resolution of only 0.71 arc second. Because if we would look at some sort of a long configurations, long baselines, we would lose the sensitivity at the short baselines and we would actually no longer be able to detect these halos. So when you are looking at sort of cosmic noon or redshift four, redshift six um, galaxies, don't just go immediately for the highest resolution. There's a tons and tons of experiments and data to be sort of extracted from the lower resolution experiments as well. 